Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the Spinosaurus Wars continue as new research casts doubt on its ability to swim, again, the first new species of living deer to be named in the 21st century has been found, the oldest evidence of hominins in Europe has been discovered, and much more. Starting off the news this week is the fantastic announcement that a new species of living deer has been discovered, making this the first living species of deer to be described in the 21st century. The new species is found in Peru and is a kind of short-legged dwarf deer, and they are actually some of the smallest deer in the world. Up until now, there were two recognised species of these dwarf deer within the genus Pudu. The northern Pudu, called Pudu mephistopheles, that inhabits Peru, Ecuador and Colombia, and the southern Pudu, Pudu puda, from southern Chile and Argentina. This new study has closely examined the anatomy of various specimens of these deer and assessed their genetic variation finding that the northern Pudu should actually be split into two species, with the new one being found to only inhabit Peru. They not only give it a new species name, but because the two northern species are genetically distinct from the southern Pudu, they also revive an old genus name to distinguish them. So Pudu mephistopheles is now Pudella mephistopheles, and the new species is called Pudella Kale named after biologist Carla Gazzolo, who according to the paper actually saved the life of the first author. So that's a very nice way to say thank you. So pretty exciting to have the first new deer species of the century. In less exciting news, sadly scientists from the British Antarctic Survey have reported that avian flu has killed a number of penguins in South Georgia. This particular bird flu pandemic was first reported in Europe in the autumn of 2020 and has gone on to kill millions of birds globally. Due to the remoteness of Antarctica and its outlying islands, the birds here have managed to escape the worst of it, but there are now fears that this is about to change. Bird flu was first detected in South Georgia in October 2023, with brown skewers and kelp gulls dying from the virus. In January of this year, cases were found in elephant and fur seals in South Georgia, as well as gentoo penguins on the Falkland Islands, and it is known to have spread to wandering albatrosses and Antarctic terns. It was only a matter of time before it spread to the penguin colonies in South Georgia, and it is thought that skewers are the vectors of this disease, as they scavenge and prey on eggs and chicks in the colonies. What's surprising is that it has only just appeared in Gentoo and King Penguin colonies, and there have only been 10 confirmed deaths from the virus. As winter descends on that part of the world, some penguins such as the macaronis disperse to spend their time at sea, which will help them avoid the infection, but kings and gentoos continue to roost on shore where they are at risk. The situation is constantly being monitored by the scientists at the two research stations in South Georgia and by tourist ships that visit the area. And stringent biosecurity measures are in place to prevent any human unwittingly spreading the disease. Only time will tell whether penguin colonies become decimated by this disease, but let's hope that this will not be the case. Also in the news, a study published in the journal Geology has taken a closer look at the mystery behind the Sturtian glaciation, a geological event that happened around 700 million years ago that saw the planet completely covered in ice for 57 million years. Quite why this extreme event happened, and indeed why it lasted so long, is not quite clear to us, but this study has opened up further possibilities to understanding how this occurred. This was a time well before animals or even complex plant life, so the dominant force in the climate was the geology of the planet. This study ran two computer simulations of the Earth's geological climate, and concluded that the most likely cause was a massive decrease in volcanic carbon dioxide emissions, which usually played an enormous part in sustaining higher global temperatures. In addition, the study shows that this combined with the weathering of what is referred to as a continental volcanic province, basically a giant, and I mean giant, volcanic rock. This weathering was a process that absorbed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so the planet was experiencing both lower carbon dioxide emissions and higher carbon dioxide absorption rates, which dramatically decreased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere to about half of what it is today, leading to the Sturtian glaciation event. A fascinating study that helps us learn more about our planet's past, and indeed helps us understand its potential future. Also in the news this last week is the intriguing report that the proposal to officially end the Holocene Epoch and recognise the Anthropocene as the current epoch we're living in has been rejected. The decision was made by a subcommittee of the International Commission on Stratigraphy called the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, or SQS, made up of a group of geologists and paleontologists who have been assessing a proposal submitted by the Anthropocene Working Group. This proposal would have officially ended the Holocene Epoch after nearly 12,000 years, and marked 1952 
as the start of the Anthropocene, after which the effects of humans would show up in the geological record. This particular date was chosen as sediment samples in Crawford Lake in Canada preserved plutonium from hydrogen bomb tests at this time, and so it was selected to be the prime example of the start of the Anthropocene, although various other sites were also considered. A vote taken by the SQS has now ruled against establishing this site as the start of a new epoch, although it seems that the ruling is getting some pushback from members of the Anthropocene Working Group, so we'll have to see what happens. Despite not being recognised as an official epoch though, the Anthropocene is still an important concept as an informal period of time that highlights the human impact on the planet, and it's definitely not going away anytime soon. As quoted in a Nature News article in the announcement, ecologist Earl Ellis points out that we need to think about this as a broader process, not as a distinct break in time. And so choosing a single point to call the start of a new epoch is not particularly useful when it's a long, ongoing process on a global scale. So, a very interesting result. We're going from one controversy to the next as we begin the paleontology news this week with the report that a new paper is out refuting previous research that found evidence of Spinosaurus being a swimmer. In 2022, a paper was published by Matteo Fabri and colleagues, including Nizar Ibrahim, which looked at a large sample of thin sections through the bones of various living and extinct animals in order to examine the relationships between bone density and aquatic habits, and then looked at how Spinosaurus fit in. What they found was a notable increase in bone density among Spinosaurids, suggesting more aquatic lifestyles, and Spinosaurus and Baryonyx in particular were found to be subaqueous foragers, which they defined as engaging in fully submerged behaviour, rather than being limited to wading about in shallow waters. Other Spinosaurids such as Suchomimus were found to have secondarily lost some of this increased bone density however, and were therefore interpreted as shallow waders rather than subaqueous foragers. This new study is a response to the 2022 Fabry et al paper, which has gone through and re-examined the methods and datasets of the previous research, finding what they say are substantial problems. These problems include unsupported classifications of lifestyle in the datasets of example species, inconsistent inclusions and exclusions of certain species, and inappropriate choice of the species used. They also criticise the statistical method used to come to the conclusion that Spinosaurus and Baryonyx were aquatic, finding that it has low accuracy when applied to the dataset. This new research did not, however, specifically aim to add to the Spinosaurus ecology debate and is more of a criticism of the way the Fabry et al study analysed their dataset and so it doesn't add anything new to the debate or fully settle anything about how Spinosaurus lived. Still, they conclude that currently the best interpretation of the animal's lifestyle is as a semi-aquatic wading animal and not one that would fully submerge and pursue prey, and say that the high bone density values of the Spinosaurus bones are likely not because they function as ballast to keep the animal submerged, but are simply related to supporting the large body mass of the animal. This is definitely not the end to the Spinosaurus debate then, and already the authors of the Fabry paper have released a preprint of a response to this new study, addressing the criticisms and maintaining that Spinosaurus and Baryonyx are recovered as subaqueous foragers. So another entertaining round of scientific conflict in the never-ending battle of Spinosaurus, and I'm sure it won't be long until the next clash begins. Also in the recent paleontology news is the wonderful announcement that a new species of prehistoric bird has been named after Sir David Attenborough. Called Imparavis attenborough, it translates to Attenborough's odd bird, and comes from the Lower Cretaceous of northeastern China, dating to about 120 million years ago. The fossil it's based on is absolutely fantastic, with almost all of the skeleton preserved intact and in articulation, and it belongs to an extinct group of birds that only lived during the Cretaceous period called the Inantionothemes. Inantionothemes were very diverse at this time, and most species actually retained teeth in their beaks, unlike living birds which are all toothless. A few later Cretaceous enantionothene species show some partial and complete tooth loss, but the newly discovered Imparavis is very special as it is now the oldest known completely toothless enantionothene, living during the early Cretaceous and showing that toothless beaks evolved in this group 48 million years earlier than we previously realised. Not only that, but the authors of the paper have also reinterpreted an already known species from the same geological formation, called Chiapiavis, as being toothless as well, indicating that it was more common among these prehistoric birds than we thought. The wing anatomy of Imparavis suggests that it was capable of fast wing beats and powerful takeoffs, and it was most likely a terrestrial forager that would have been able to quickly burst into flight to get into the trees if any predators came its way. A really amazing new discovery there then. 
Up next in the paleo news, a new species of ornithopod dinosaur has just been named from Argentina. This is the first Ornithischian dinosaur to be described and given a name from the late Cretaceous aged Huincul formation, which is famously home to the enormous Titanosaur Argentinosaurus, the giant Carcharodontosaurus Mapusaurus and Miraxes, plus many others. This new species has been given the name Chachisaurus Neckel, and it would have been a small herbivorous dinosaur. The fossils known for the species include vertebrae, bits of hip, partial limbs, feet and ribs from four individuals representing adults and juveniles, plus a neck vertebra from another individual. Chachisaurus is related to other ornithopods in a grouping called Elasmaria, adding to the known diversity of these dinosaurs and revealing more about their anatomy, including new details about their tails. Since Chachisaurus preserves a lot of the tail vertebrae, the paleontologists have been able to reveal that Elasmarians actually had a unique shape to them, having what is called a protonic posture, where the base of the tail curves down slightly, something that was previously only thought to have been present in some titanosaurian dinosaurs. Other features of the tail also indicate that these dinosaurs have adaptations to running that are convergent with certain groups of theropod dinosaurs, showing that this lineage of ornithopods had a unique combination of traits. So another wonderful new dinosaur discovery this week. And finally for the news this week is the very exciting publication of a paper that has dated what turns out to be the oldest record of hominins in Europe. Stone tools made in the older one's style of construction and associated with Homo erectus were found at a site called Korolevo in western Ukraine in the 1970s. And although they've been studied much in the past, this new paper has now securely dated the age of the oldest stone artifacts found at the locality. Using cosmogenic nuclide dating to calculate when these artifacts were buried, they found that they were 1.42 million years old, and so they are now the oldest known definitely dated evidence of hominin presence in Europe. The next oldest record of hominins in Europe comes from around 1.2 to 1.1 million year old sites in Spain and southern France, and so this new study helps to bridge the gap between these younger pieces of evidence and the older 1.85 to 1.78 million year old site of Dimanesi in Georgia where some incredible hominin fossils have been found. As such, the dating of Korolevo in Ukraine also supports the hypothesis that the earliest wave of hominin dispersal into Europe, of which there were many, occurred from east to west, as well as indicating that the warmer interglacial period around this time enabled these early hominins to spread into higher latitudes, and it marks the northernmost known presence of what was probably Homo erectus. So another fantastic addition to our ever-increasing understanding of human evolution and dispersal. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you've enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time.